Today we're going to talk about a very interesting randomized controlled trial that was published back in February of 2022 on intermittent fasting. I'm Dr. Roger Schwell. Welcome to another True Health Tuesdays. Now, intermittent fasting has been a interesting topic. There's been a number of papers that have been published that have showed some efficacy and also some other papers that have showed a lack of efficacy. So it's been actually a bit of a controversial topic. But today we're going to look at a head-to-head randomized control trial, which is the best type of evidence, and looking at seeing whether or not eating in the morning and restricting eating to just in the morning or the morning hours or early versus restricting eating to midday or later afternoon. So the name of this study is Randomized Control Trial for Time-Restricted Eating in Healthy Volunteers Without Obesity. So this is the type of person that we're looking for here and specifically about. And there are two major different types of interventions in this study. One is called ETRF, and that has to do with food intake that is restricted to the early part of the day. So that would be calories particularly ingested in the morning time. So bigger breakfasts, much lighter dinners, things of that nature, versus the other type, which is a midday TRF or time-restricted feeding, which is restricted food to the middle of the day. Okay. So in this situation, they conducted a five-week randomized control trial to compare the effects of the two TRF regimens, one where it is restricted to the morning and one that is restricted to the midday. And these are in healthy individuals without obesity. And there was one more group, and that was the control group. So they took 90 participants and randomized them to 30 in the early time-restricted feeding group, 30 in the midday time-restricted feeding group, and then finally 30 in a control group using a computer-based random number generator. And as it turns out, 82 participants completed the entire five-week trial. So that's pretty good in terms of not having a lot of dropout. And they wanted to see what would happen to insulin resistance. Now, the researchers who assessed the outcomes were blinded to the group assignment, but the participants and the caregivers were not. So it was not a double-blinded study, but rather a single-blinded randomized controlled trial. So first of all, there was no adverse events reported during the trial, so that was good. And sort of cutting to the chase here, what did they show? They showed that it was the early treatment group, the early time-restricted feeding group, that was more effective than either the midday time-restricted feeding group or the control group at improving insulin sensitivity, which is the key. But let's take a look at some of the, the actual results that came back. So here we're looking at a number of different topics here. And uh, the first one is A, and that's the change in energy intake when they started this. And of course, the control group was zero because they didn't change much. But you can see in both the early time-restricted feeding group and the midday time-restricted feeding group, there was a statistically significant reduction in the energy intake. And if you want to know more in terms of the specifics, the early treatment, the early time-restricted feeding group was a eating period of no more than eight hours between six o'clock in the morning and three o'clock in the afternoon and fasting for the rest of the day, whereas a midday time-restricted feeding group was no more than eight hours between 11 o'clock in the morning and eight o'clock at night and fasting for the rest of the day. And then of course the control group was eating whenever they wanted to eat. So once again, in the both the early time-restricted feeding and the midday time-restricted feeding group, there was a statistically significantly lower amount of energy intake, which means that whenever you restrict eating, it's going to cause a reduction in the amount of energy intake. That's not a surprise. The question is, is which one do you get a better benefit out of? Now, when they looked at Delta Homa IR, which is a measure 
of the insulin sensitivity, notice that there was better sensitivity. There was a reduction in the HOMAIR, which is good, in the early time-restricted feeding group and, and not much of a difference here at all between the control group and the midday time-restricted feeding group. Now, this is really important to understand. A lot of times studies are done on just time-restricted eating, but here we're starting to see that it matters based on the circadian rhythm whether or not that time-restricted eating is centered around the morning time when circadian rhythm is designed to have that type of ingestion of calories, or whether it's later in the evening when it's not. Uh, let's take a look at the change in the fasting plasma glucose. Notice again that the biggest reduction here was in the early time-restricted feeding. That, that is not surprising because we know that the body is more sensitive to insulin in the morning than it is in the evening. As you can see here that the midday time-restricted feeding group really didn't have much of a difference from the control group. So you may be doing time-restricted feeding, but if you're doing it at the wrong time, it doesn't really make a difference. Let's look at the change in body weight. Now, this is really interesting here. Notice that despite the fact that there was a reduction in caloric intake, there was a difference here in terms of reduction in body weight in the early time-restricted feeding group. In other words, you could restrict calories just as well in the midday time-restricted feeding, but not see a really statistically significant difference. What about change in body fat? Notice here that the only statistical significant difference here was between the early time-restricted feeding and the control group, okay? And in terms of delta in body fat mass, again, the only statistical significant difference was that between the early time-restricted feeding and the control group. What does all this sort of lead to? That if you're going to do time-restricted eating and limit your intake of calories to eight hours a day, it's best to do it earlier in the day when the circadian rhythm is keyed into that. Let's take a look at a couple of other things here. Here we see the change in tumor necrosis factor alpha. Again, the reduction was statistically significant only in the early time-restricted feeding group. Same for the delta in the IL-8. There was a reduction there. And also for a reduction in AST, which has to do with uh, liver toxicity from non-alcoholic ste steatohepatitis. Again, early time-restricted feeding group. Here we see the amount of T cells, and we can see that there was an increase, which is good. Again, in the early time-restricted feeding group, that the change in the diversity of the microbiota of the gut was higher in the early time-restricted feeding group, and that the eating frequency was statistically significantly less in the early time-restricted feeding and the midday time-restricted feeding group but despite that, across the board, the measurements that we wanted to see were either larger or exclusively seen in the early time-restricted feeding group. Again, going back, looking at insulin resistance in healthy non-obese, they said that the early time-restricted feeding group showed a larger reduction in HOMA IR, which is good, than either the midday time-restricted feeding group or the control group but there was no difference between the changes in the midday time-restricted feeding and the control groups. So they say here in the discussion that the present study has shown that five weeks of early time-restricted feeding, but not midday time-restricted feeding, improves insulin sensitivity, reduces fasting, plasma glucose, reduces body mass and adiposity, ameliorates inflammation, and increases gut microbial diversity. However, there was no significant differences among the three groups with respect to blood pressure, circulating lipid concentrations, hemoglobin A1C, HSCRP, which is a inflammatory marker, sleep quality, or appetite. The study also goes on to say that the good compliance between the two protocols in the present study implies that time-restricted feeding is an easy-to-execute fasting regimen and that the similar compliance 
suggest that they are similarly feasible. Now, realize that in both groups, they were both told to just eat whatever they wanted to, but limit it to eight-hour days or eight-hour periods of time during the day. There was no specific nutritional guidance given to them. And uh, what's interesting here is that there were energy reductions in both the midday and the early, but the health benefits were seen in just the early which means that these benefits were not caused by differences in energy intake. And by the way, these findings showing a benefit of improving insulin sensitivity, there are numerous studies which show this. This is not a unique finding, and this has been seen over and over and over again, that the body is most sensitive to insulin in the morning. For instance, here is another article that was published back in 2014, titled Diurnal Variation in Insulin Sensitivity of Glucose Metabolism is Associated with Diurnal Variations in Whole Body and Cellular Fat Acid Metabolism in Metabolically Normal Women. And in the study, they measured plasma and free fatty acid concentration, palmitate kinetics, and skeletal muscle expression of genes involved in fatty acid metabolism at breakfast and dinner in 13 overweight but metabolically normal women. And what they found was that fatty acid concentration was 30% greater just before consuming dinner than breakfast, and that was statistically significant, and remained greater after dinner than breakfast. So therefore, they concluded that metabolically normal women demonstrate diurnal variations in fatty acid metabolism, manifested by an increase in circulating fatty acids, presumably derived from previous meal consumption, rather than lipolysis, or the breakdown of adipose tissue, triglycerides, and a shift in muscle fatty acid metabolism from oxidation to lipogenesis. These metabolic alterations could be responsible for the known evening decline in insulin sensitivity. And here's the key word that I want you to see here. This is a very well-known, even back in 2014, a known decline in insulin sensitivity. What does this mean? This means that if you are ingesting calories towards the end of the day, it's going to take more insulin to deal with those calories. And higher amounts of insulin means insulin resistance, which can lead to all sorts of downstream effects from higher levels of insulin. Now, we've talked about before and we've shown that infrared light and red light actually increases the metabolic activity of the mitochondria and reduces glucose. And so it's becoming clearer and clearer here that, uh, that ingesting carbohydrates or even just calories in general is better done when the sun is up. And I would even say more towards the mor morning based on the circadian rhythm findings. So what can we glean from this information? That we should start to plan our meals around eating breakfast like a king, lunch like a queen or prince, and dinner like a pauper. And the reason is, is because our circadian rhythm is specifically designed and put in place to have the enzymes and the substrates and the pathways primed for dealing with caloric intake in the morning time. As we can see here, the delta fasting plasma glucose was lower when we had the time-restricted feeding to the morning and not into the afternoon or even into the control group. Once again, these people with the ETRF or the time-restricted feeding in the morning, was eating during a period of no more than eight hours between 6 o'clock in the morning and 3 o'clock in the afternoon and fasting for the rest of the day. This means you can drink water but intake no calories. And I can tell you, this is something that I've asked my patients who have had issues with fatigue, issues with sleeping at night, to start to employ this type of intervention and I have noticed in my patients uh, some improvements in their symptomatology, specifically in long COVID patients.
This may not be for everyone, although notice that in this study there were very minimal side effects. But it's something to definitely consider doing in your life and in lifestyle and see if this doesn't make a benefit where we restrict our eating in the evening time and concentrate more of the intake of our calories in the morning time. Now, you may notice that during the first period of this is done that you're hungry in the evening. It's because your body is used to eating calories in the evening time. But as you start to get used to this, after about a month or two, you will start to notice that your body starts to become more attuned. And whereas you might not have been hungry in the morning to take those calories, your body will be adjusted and ready for that to happen. And whereas you might have been hungry in the evening time expecting to have dinner, when your body is used to the fact that it's not going to have dinner, you won't have those symptoms. So don't feel like the inability to eat or being hungry are reasons not to employ this technique.